Okay, I think everybody's here, so let's get started. Uh, welcome everybody to our um, thought leadership session on sustainability for specialist subcontractors. I'm David Norcott. I work for Wessex Archaeology We're based in Salisbury, but we've got regional offices all around the UK. I'm the business development and environment agency framework lead, but also part of the sustainability team, which includes people from across different teams in the organisation. Uh, like others, we've been looking at our carbon footprint over the last few years and, and trying to reduce the impact of our work, uh, not least for, for, for clients like the Environment Agency. But we've also been trying to explore positive contributions that our work can make towards other areas of sustainability like community and environment. And we thought it was likely those conversations would be going on elsewhere in, in other organisations. So we proposed this session to share ideas try and start a conversation about the best way forward, which we'll hope we'll be able to continue beyond this event. So if anyone watching is interested in getting involved in that ongoing conversation, please do drop us a line. I've just got a little bit of housekeeping. So there's, you'll probably see the slides are pretty small. If you click on this icon down in your bottom right, it will make uh, it full screen and your, your slides will be bigger and so will the people. But you'll have to exit that in order to see the polls and the Q&A. Apologies, that's not perfect, but it's the best way we've found to do it. Uh, there'll be a number of polls running as we go. They're actually all up there live already. So please feel free to go through them and uh, do them in one go if you want. Or as we get to each particular theme, I'll, I'll flag them up. And uh, questions. We'd really love your input on the themes we're discussing. So uh, please do feel free to add comments, ideas and questions uh, via the Q&A tab. And we'll try and pick up on those as we go through the session today. Uh, and we've also got uh, 10 minutes for Q&A and discussion at the end where we'll try and pick up on any we've missed. So welcome to our panellists. Uh, we've got specialist subcontractor representatives from, from lots of different fields, as well as some collaborative delivery team leads and the Environment Agency. I do apologise to Matt Phillips, who's meant to be here, but we've had a bit of an IT fail with a number of people who can access, so he's he's not here. I do apologise, Matt, if you're watching, which I'm sure you are. Uh, if you wouldn't mind just giving each other, giving yourselves rather a brief introduction, maybe uh, going down the list, starting from the top left with you, Mark. Um, <clears throat> hi all, my name's Mark Williams, I'm the Regional Manager for Wessex Archaeology London and South East based in Maidstone. Um, I work primarily in field work so that's the area of our work which has the most direct impact on the environment and is often the most visible. Um, I also advise clients on the implications of heritage for their developments. Um, hi I'm Hannah Dwan, I'm the Region Operations Manager uh, for Geotechnics. We are a ground investigation company. Um, I'm the manager for the, the South West office, but based in Exeter. I uh, run all operations uh, to do with yeah, our field work um, primarily, but obviously also the impacts we have um, running the office as well as, as what, what impact we can make on sites or not make um, from a sustainability and environmental point of view. So, yeah. Uh, Colin Scott from uh, ABP Mer, um, independent environmental consultancy, a wholly owned subsidiary of Associated British Ports. I specialise in habitat creation, particularly, as, uh, and, uh, and it's certainly a, a, main, a key area of our work. But we have a team of uh, 50 people here who, who, who cover all things marine, from from policy to planning to to modelling to coastal processes, the full spectrum. Hello, I'm Tessa Harding. Um, I'm Head of Water Services at Thompson Environmental Consultants. Um, so Thompson is an SME um, and most recently an employee owned trust. Um, we specialise in ecology, so terrestrial and aquatic ecology, um, hydrology, GIS, EIA and most recently climate change. We also have um, a habitat creation and management business and a marine laboratory. So I'm responsible for the freshwater ecology and hydrology, and I have oversight of our marine team. Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Matthew. I'm the strategic manager here at Flannery Plant, which effectively means I have oversight over all of the non-operational side um, of the business. Uh, Flannery Plant are one of the UK's largest providers of operated and self-drive plants and equipment. Uh, we range from your big bulk earthworks right the way down to smaller excavators and dumpers. Um, and I guess within my remit um, as part of Flannery, what I'm very 
focused on is understanding where we can drive better value for our clients. So how to do the task that they were doing anyway, more effectively, more efficiently. Oh, uh, David, I think you're on mute, but uh, we apologies. <laughs> I was going to say uh, Matt's not here, which is entirely our fault due to an IT fail. So Nick, over to you next. Thanks very much. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Nick Rothwell, I'm a sustainability consultant at Atkins, uh, and I sit within our infrastructure business. Um, my, I sort of specialize in carbon management for infrastructure, um, most, mostly focusing on linear infrastructure and working in the aviation sector. And recently, um, I've taken on the role of um, sustainability lead for Atkins uh, for the EA in um, the Southwest Hub under the CDF framework. Hi, and good morning. Joe Murphy from the Environment Agency. I have spent most of my Environment Agency life, I suppose, in, in the flood risk management area in some form or other. Um, environmental assessment, sustainability, carbon, supply chain particularly. Um, but now I'm in sustainable business and looking at um, how we can drive our corporate strategy and, and our sustainability goals through all the work that we do. And my particular um, area of interest at the moment is um, looking at the sustainable development goals and how we express value through that and, and how we join all of these sorts of themes together. So um, really looking forward to the discussion. To Fantastic. Then, Thanks very much, everybody. Oh, I'm not muted for once. That's good. <laughs> uh, so there is a poll attached to this first section just to, to get everybody going as watching, which is have you developed a new sustainability or low carbon policy in the last two years? Um, right. So we were covering three main themes in sections of about 10 to 15 minutes each uh, during the session. So our first theme is um, we called carbon and beyond. We're basically, we're going to try and share ideas on what we're all up to already with sustainability, both in terms of reducing carbon, but also anything else we've got to say. Uh, demonstrating value is an interesting one. So we're going to look at how we can better understand and demonstrate our contribution to sustainability as part of the EA supply chain. And then in the collaborative delivery section, we're going to look at ways we can work together more closely to reduce impact and improve sustainability outcomes. As I say, we've got about 10 to 15 minutes on each theme, so we might not have time to go in as depth as we'd like on some issues, but it should be time to touch on some interesting things. But we do intend to make time following this event to keep these conversations going. So again, please do drop us a line if you want to be involved in those conversations. So without further ado, I shall move us on to our, our first theme of carbon and beyond. So here we're going to share our ideas on what sustainability measures we've already got in place and any ideas we might have for the future. Um, I think probably try and limit initial contributions to you know, a minute or so. So we've still got room for discussion. We can ask each other about them as we go. There's another poll on there. Um, if you minimize and then go to the screen on the right. When thinking of sustainability, which of these is most relevant to your business, environment, society and culture and economy? So I've got a, a question for the panel to, to start discussion off. So clearly carbon is the most pressing issue uh, for most people at the minute for obvious reasons. How are you tackling this issue at the moment? And do you think you're in a position to start looking at other aspects of sustainability yet? Does anybody want to volunteer to go first? Um, I will if... Uh, go for it, Mark. Um, yeah, well, um, as you said, Dave, in terms of um, the environment, like everybody else, we've recognised the, the serious implications of our current uh, carbon heavy lifestyle and have been looking at ways to reduce those impacts. And I suspect very similar to all organisations, um, such as reducing journey times, increasing energy efficiency, that sort of thing. Um, but more broadly, as an educational charity, uh, we've been very much geared towards uh, providing value through um, societal, societal and cultural aspects of sustainability. Um, what sustainability has encouraged us to do, though, is look broader beyond our sort of um, traditional remit to look at how different aspects of sustainability um, and our uh, work within it interact and can be mutually reinforcing. Um, as archaeologists, we are in a strong position to understand how economy, environment and society have in, uh, interacted in the past. And we think we've got quite a lot to uh, contribute in, that, in those areas. Um, 
for example, increasing communities' um, sense of place, posi uh, positively engaging and educating local people on the realities of flood risk um, in their floodplain and coastal areas, and more broadly in um, educating people on environmental change and cultural responses to that. So, um, so yeah, um, sustainability in general is encouraged us to look more broadly than perhaps we had done in the past. David, uh, it's Chris over at Flannery. I think Mark's answered very eloquently from uh, from his perspective in terms of the impact of um, environmental factors on his business and, and what you do to, to affect change. I've got a very polarizing window of um, the impact that I and my customers have on the environment. And I'm a, I'm a big numbers man, so I'll throw some scary ones out at you. Um, the, the fleet that we run burnt in excess of 164 million liters of fuel last year, um, performing the actions that uh, my clients wanted them to do. Um, it, that's a huge number. It's, it's impossible to get your head around. So we we view that as something that within our scope three remit, we can really have a positive um, impact on, on driving that number down for the same amount of work consumed. Um, so that's, that's investment, whether it be in alternative fuels, whether it be in modern, uh, more efficient plant. But then the next piece is, is huge in terms of education, helping the operators, because at the end of the day, it's down to the squidgy bit, the human on the seat in terms of how they choose to operate that machine. So training and education has been brought right up the agenda within uh, our organization to help not only our guys, but also your members of staff um, use those bits of equipment more effectively. And then that we, we extrapolate that out to how do I actually work for you? So our trucks and trailers, you know, we, uh, we spent nearly three and a half million pounds on white diesel just delivering to your sites. Um, that's again a huge scary number. So what can we do to impact that? And it's a combination of training, investment, um, and making sure we're being as efficient as possible. Um, so yeah, there's a, it's, it's been a big step change in the last couple of years. Wow, good stuff. Yeah, yeah just, it has, uh, and I think, oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> I think for, from a from a client perspective, we've really seen that step up in in the supply chain and. Um, fleet is, is one of our massive hotspots alongside construction that has been flagged up in the net zero strategy that we recently launched um and and i think in terms of that those seas and that construction element um there's so much that we're doing to to look at the trajectory trajectories into the future to see well what what is the supply chain decarbonization trajectory and and then what else do we need to do so our strategy is both reducing absolutely and then offsetting the rest but but i think the point here is that um carbon is one of the four quadrants of our strategy so we also have the people side the resources side um the environmental gain and um it's yeah it's it's that debate around, is it a climate first approach or, or is it an everything together approach? Um, and we're, um, our, our next steps are to set out really clear accountable plans for those other areas which will support the delivery of that carbon agenda. Um, but it's linking it all up on the ground, I think that, that matters to us, um, the catchment scale partnerships and nature-based solutions, those sorts of things that can deliver all our carbon reduction, but can also deliver value for all of those other elements as well. Um, yeah, and, and we've, we've really seen the supply chain are, are really keen to get involved in those sorts of things. Plant for us, plant is certainly the elephant in the room when it when it comes to looking at our reducing our carbon and actually ways we yeah we can do that are, are top of our list. I think. Sorry, I meant to be I meant to be moderating, not just jumping. In. <laughs> Interesting to hear those those comments because for us um, transport and travel is is absolutely sort of central to our um, or at least our sort of carbon footprint because so much of the work we do is um, traveling to sites for doing ecological surveys but we also operate plants as part of our our habitat management and habitat creation business so um, it is sort of very focused around transport and to a lesser extent around the sustainability of our office locations, some of which are within our control and, and some of which aren't. And we I haven't got the numbers um, that, that Chris had around sort of business miles, but it's some eye-watering amount and you know several journeys to the moon and back each each year that you know we we spend in just simply um, you know getting to site and back and you know we have a workforce in the 
in the summer of around 150 people. So, um, you know, it very quickly racks up. So we are we're also looking at um, a whole sort of um, raft of ways in which we can try and tackle that that kind of business mile um, carbon footprint. And for our head office, we're looking at um, vehicle charging points um, and then switching our vehicles to um, electric. Um, now, obviously, so we've canvassed all our staff and looked at, you know, the sort of feasibility of that. And I think there's still quite a lot of concern around the range of, of electric vehicles um, for achieving that and, and also for our um, site based um, vehicles it's sort of are there vehicles out there in the market that will fulfill that purpose so yeah there's quite a lot of questions still to be answered but um, you know we, we're definitely there sort of trying to, to tackle that and we're also considering um, at the moment the, the the pledge for net zero in line with the UK government's SME climate hub so that's that's another area of focus for us. Fantastic, uh, Colin. I, I know you work in um, habitat recreation, so I guess a lot of your work is is effectively work that you're doing for the Environment Agency is also offsetting uh, to an to an extent other carbon. If I'm not putting words in your mouth, it, I mean, it, 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 yes. Shall, shall we start by saying that's complex? Um, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, and just in terms of us, you know, we, we obviously, you know, being part of the sort of the, the ABP parent group, you know, but ABP has its own massive challenges uh, with with with, it, with addressing uh, uh, carbon, but is but is putting measures in place. It has seen its its, its carbon uh, carbon budget you know decrease uh, over the last few years, but you know, and putting in things like uh, uh, you know, electrical connections to to birth, birthed up birthed up vessels at birth so you know we, we, are, we are you know we are starting to see improvements and, and you know electric cars moving between different locations and, and things like that at the port of Southampton so there are, there are measures being put in place um, when, when coming to your question about habitat creation then yes I mean for us personally as ABP Mer, then then habitat creation certainly for me is, is my key key area of interest and we have for a long time been banging the drum about the carbon value of the the habitats that we are restoring at the coast um, but it has been a difficult it's it, it's 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 continuing to prove to be difficult to focus the science at, at a point to go in a single direction um, there are big challenges like additionality so would would the project you are doing have been done anyway so so it, it's it's it, and, and, and and so you, you have the question of you know we we were committed to compensating for for for, ha for habitat losses anyway. That's most of what we've done over the last thirty years is compensate for losses. We would have done that anyway. So, can you say that any of the vast quantities of carbon we have trapped in all those habitats we've created, three thousand three hundred hectares of coastal habitat over thirty years, is that additional? Um, what is interesting and what I find really interesting is that the habitats that they've replaced. The, the, the restored habitats probably sequester vastly more carbon than the habitats that were lost. So you have got a net gain of carbon. Um, Presumably, so, those the the benefits that come from from that um, habitat creation also map very well against other areas of sustainability too. Though, so like improve, improved place making and community benefits and various other things like that, I'm sure um, would fit well into what Joe was talking about. Uh, yeah, which, yeah, yeah. A, a, absolutely. All, all of those, and we're seeing, you know, um, you know sites being used for recreation and, and uh, improving flood protection. All of those kind of things. And, and, and there is. I gave a talk earlier in, in, in the week to the coastal resilience session, in which I tried to explain how we are we are seeking to embrace all of those much better. Not, 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 just, not us as contractors, but you know, the MMO, the Environment Agency, NRW are all seeking to understand these broad benefits much more clearly, so that we can then communicate communicate them and accelerate accelerate the delivery of more projects and and it's and 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 what we need to do next is get the science of carbon coming back to carbon the science of carbon as quickly quite quickly robust and then we need to be thinking about what projects we can do on the basis of well that is going to be a carbon project that wouldn't have been done anywhere uh, for any other reason and, and 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 if we can do that then i think we can start to tap into the carbon market and start to really get some impressive projects done um, just for a carbon reason if you don't mind i better move on because we've only got a few minutes and i want to make sure everybody gets a chance to talk uh, who's up for going next 
Nick? I'm happy to go next, yeah. Um, I suppose my, from Atkins, from a sort of design perspective, it, we kind of take a different dis- perspective to to what's been talked about a lot here. So I think our focus is um, kind of earlier stages of, of projects and, and kind of strategic decision making ar- around. Uh, and this is something that we're trying to focus on a lot more is sort of working with our clients about what projects we should go forward with in the first place. Um, and so thinking about what where. Where clients want to invest. Was uh, Am I still with you? You are. You're with us. You're invisible, but you are with us. I was just trying to work out okay, if that was good. my <laughs> IT or your. <laughs> yeah, so something's uh, something's happening, but um, yeah. So so working with our clients around investment decisions around. Um, projects um, within programs and thinking about um, the carbon reduction hierarchy and where we can start having conversations around building nothing and building less. So our focus a lot a lot in infrastructure is around the kind of embodied carbon um, and whole life carbon within within the infrastructure that we're designing. So really thinking um, thinking yes something new and thinking you know do we need it in the first place? Can we avoid building it? Can we look at alternative solutions where we might be able to revise the program, the amount of construction that's required? And if that can't be taken forward, can we refurbish what's existing? And those early decisions have such opportunity to affect the amount of that you could save. Do the okay now we're going to build something how are we going to sort of reduce the scale of that building or are we going to uh, or using all the uh, so it's it's really kind of the earlier stages um carbon reduction hierarchy and the earlier stages of project decision making that we're trying to trying to affect yeah. Certainly from our perspective, and I suspect lots of other specialist subcontractors as well, getting in early at the design stage is absolutely key to, to building in that value, that both lessening of impact and, and adding other value. Uh, so, I mean, that's something we could probably get onto in collaboration later on. But yeah, designing out impact and designing in sustainability value at the early stage is, is I think, going to be the way that we we want to try and be going that's not always uh, as easy done as said of course but uh, yeah sorry Hannah, I, I, I don't think you've had a chance to talk yet go ahead. um yeah i don't i don't think i've got much more to add um i think geotechnics uh along running along the same lines topics that people have spoken about transport and fleet management is a big thing for us because we work all over the country but we do have regional regional offices we have explored switching our vehicles over to electric um, vans and things like that the, the technology is not quite there yet um, for us uh, but it's certainly on the on the th- list of things to, yeah. to aim we're, for. we're in exactly the same place I think as, as all of you guys with electric vehicles and vans it's like vehicles are becoming doable and the infrastructure is not too difficult to put in it's the when a yeah. van's coming online is, is the big thing especially four by fours I think yeah they're, they're not they're not quite there yet um i think the only other thing from our point of view is uh with the carbon thing is is our consumables and make doing what we can to make sure we um source our consumables from a sustainable source plus um <clears throat> it's a big focus for me at the moment is trying to or us is trying to reduce the amount of plastic that we use which i know is a hot topic for everybody as well but in the grand investigation industry we are asked to take so many soil and rock samples and as yet there are not very many alternative options other than the plastic big bulk plastic bags and the plastic tubs that are used um we do what we can to recycle as much as possible but um there are a lot of people i think starting to be more people you know looking at the alternatives of biodegradable yeah. we've got exactly things. the same issues actually yeah. with archaeology uses an awful lot of sample tubs and finds bags and things like that and yeah finding biodegradable stuff and stuff that you can find recyclable um, routes yeah. for it's quite difficult um, but yeah it's oh. doable so Nick did you have uh, one last thing to say I uh, cut you off when you were just responding there and then we'll move on to the next topic you're muted by the way and invisible I know you are there <laughs> <laughs> um, 
it wasn't anything uh, major, really. I, I just wanted to okay. wanted to add to that sort of strategic decision making point about how important it is to um, engage with the entire value chain from as early as early as possible. So, start not just thinking from a sort of design perspective um, and having those conversations with the client, but starting to engage with contractors and suppliers early on, so that we. Yeah sort of engage with those suppliers to work out okay are there more sustainable products that we can be using and designing in from the beginning which makes it easier to actually implement Absolutely. going I forward. know if, um, if Matt Phillips from Kier had been able to make it on sorry again my <laughs> IT failed that you're not here but he'd be he'd be echoing that um, robustly I'm sure right if yeah. you don't mind need to move on to the um, next section so our next theme is demonstrating value so Pretty much all the main contractors we work for now, if not every single one of them, to be honest, have sustainability front and centre as part of their, their company ethos, as do the Environment Agency, of course. But how do we, as a relatively small part of that supply chain, best demonstrate and evidence the value that we can bring in terms of sustainability? So I, I guess to, to word that differently, my question to the panel would be, how are you currently measuring or evidence the sustainability value of your work or how do you plan to? Um, maybe let's start off. We'll pick on someone. Uh, how about you, Chris? Because I know you do it with gadgets, so you should have a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, I, I, listening to the other panelists, I think um, I'm in a very favourable position in that I've got a lot of technology at my disposal, and, and quite literally, we're getting flooded with new new solutions to measure various things. So, we as a company have just gone through our um, journey for ISO 50001. So, we are now accredited to measure our scope one, scope two emissions. Um, now, that was a painful process to do the first time, but it's taught us some good lessons in terms of what is our kilowatt hour output for all our facilities? How much fuel do we burn? What is our um, kilowatt per mile um, across our fleet, whether you be an electric van or a diesel truck? Um, and that's before we start talking about the plant, where we can now drill down into the nth degree in terms of how that asset's being used and compare outputs. So we can actually pr compare production cycles, so cost per tonne. Um, which gives us a bit of a benchmark. It gives us best case. Then you throw some new technology at it. So it might be an electric machine and we can do real world like for like comparisons. So actually evidencing that for our clients has become a lot easier. The challenge still remains with the softer skills. Uh, so that's how we train our human operators to operate to a higher standard. Now we can of course measure that uh, across a period of time. So we could, for example, measure the difference between before a training course and after a training course, and then over a longer period of time. The challenge we've got as a supplier to you all is how do I give you a trained operator, train, Im help them improve their process and track that for you during, through, for the duration of a hire. Um, because your scope one emissions is dependent on the machine that you hire for a period of time, whereas my journey is annualized. <laughs> so that operator is working for me somewhere across the course of a year. So there are some subtleties that we need to work on. But I think for me, the big step change that we need to make in our industry is the understanding and acceptance of this technology is there. It's not something that's pie in the sky. It's not something that's next year or, or in five years time. We're already measuring you. Um, but our client base needs to become more sophisticated with us in terms of requesting and understanding what that information is telling them. Excellent. Who fancy to go next? <laughs> well, then uh, it's yeah, almost it's entirely the opposite in that we don't have uh, gadgets to measure to some extent what we do. Um, I, we, we've, as archaeologists, we've um, frequently used archaeology and heritage to provide a positive connection to local communities. Um, I think with the advent of sustainability, though, we, we haven't really, it's demonstrated we haven't really had the language to sort of um, show that value. Um, we've worked with um, partner organisations explicitly towards sustainable outcomes um, in terms of the, the social and cultural side, such as our work with Operation Nightingale, working with returning veterans, for instance. Um, but what we have started to do is look at mapping what we do against the sustainable development goals. I think we had a slide of these, Dave. Oh, which, yeah. yeah. J just for those of you who are less familiar with these, um, um, as a measure of, of how we contribute towards sustainable development. So the goals themselves are not perfect, um, but they are 
wide ranging and they do encourage encourage collaborative working um, and are explicitly designed to encourage businesses to take a more active involvement whereas the preceding millennium development goals are very much focused on governmental involvement um, just just examples of what we can do which are perhaps pertinent here is that um, our work in wetland environments provides information about previous changes of cl in climate and how humans have reacted to that change um, and that in itself is a direct contribution to um, uh, goal 13 um, target 3 which is education on climate change so we have lots of stories to tell which we can help uh, which can help sort of um, provide narratives to some of these issues I think is what uh, our best contribution is yeah they're, they're complicated but they have been really useful for us in providing yeah a structure and a language to kind of evidence the the value of of what we do aren't they anyway we don't want to yeah. just talk about archaeology i know <laughs> yeah no that's that's absolutely our experience as well and the the project that i'm doing at the moment is using the goal specifically at the target level to understand how we can um how we can use them as a language to create partnerships, to identify opportunities, to identify aligned objectives. Back to what Nick was saying about that really early design phase, that early stakeholder engagement. Um, but it's it's one step further than that. It's how do we then integrate that into, into the whole appraisal, the, the whole chain of events that happens after we decide what we're doing. Um, and we have, just actually closed consultation on integrating the sustainable development goals our, our internal environment agency framework we're piloting it and i've crm um in into the benefits management framework so we will track and measure and report on our contribution to the targets via the benefits management process because that process tracks the whole life of an investment right through to its operation it can connect everybody in the process so that's that's one way um we're looking at doing it and i think when you when you're talking about value um it's a really important word at the moment um and you know in the green book and treasury is saying when you make decisions it's not just about benefit cost it's also about the value and expressing that value and that together should create your business case for an investment so it's really important that we we um understand value in that wider sense and we begin to be able to monetize it i think the challenge we have is um is data collection and is and is understanding that data um you know the work flannery done on on that that's that's brilliant but what's difficult for us is gathering it all up and pulling it all together and i could talk for an hour about data lakes but um you know it's it's bringing it together to tell that that portfolio level story and and that's where a lot of work is happening but that's where our challenges are fantastic i get a, a, a part of the difficulty i think is is in um what units do you measure it in you, know, you, you target whatever from goal whatever but do you do you go with a minor moderate significant impact as a kind of um a guide or yeah is it out of 10 or in pounds it's 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 a difficult one isn't it how it you is, measure but, value but sometimes it's it's quite simple and there are indicators aligned to the, the the targets but they're yeah as mark was saying you know they're for global we, we've created indicators that match our um our relevant geography and that type of thing and they're a bit more specific than that fantastic um, it does take a lot of effort for, <laughs> for suppliers to report on them it takes a lot of effort for suppliers to do that so would anybody else like to to jump in i i, I was interested actually because you know the the point about evidencing and demonstrating value um you know we as a business obviously very focused on ecology and um the whole language now around biodiversity net gain and the use of different classification systems in order to demonstrate a net gain um you know it's a relatively new language and um i think that's probably much more our focus than you know, there's an there's an increasing focus on, on carbon, but certainly the um, the habitat benefits of mitigation schemes and how you quantify that, and you know the the extent to which the existing metrics are valuable in that sense is you know is very much a, a focus for our um, for our work. And actually, um, one of our our sort of um, areas of development, if you like, is 
um, with our climate change specialists is how we can use um, newly new habitat areas to help our clients offset their carbon um, footprint at a sort of project level. So, you know, being able to effectively almost offer carbon credits through habitat creation schemes, which would effectively be an investment by Thompson um, in areas for which new habitat schemes can be created and, and can help almost carbon insetting, but um, sort of somewhere between insetting and offsetting. So that's, you know, in order to achieve that, there needs to be some careful kind of measurement of the um, of, of the, the sort of carbon sequestration of, of various habitats. So it's a really exciting area that we, we're just sort of starting to delve into. Okay, is everybody had a chance to? Oh, Colin, you're about to. Respond. I, I, I would only follow on from what yeah. Tessa was saying. I think, you know, I think, I, I, we, we, in terms of adding value, from our perspective, we we, we do our project work for clients that are seeking to 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 to, to achieve sustainable goals or, or you know understand understand the, the value of the, the marine environment for carbon, um, but also our own research on top of that, in which we try and explore the linkages and, and fix the linkages between policy and science as much as we can and net gain is one area where we're doing quite a lot of that work carbon is, is another one uh, and, and and we're doing you know, a, a number of studies to look at the broader ecosystem services of of, of, of projects uh, and and their value but i think for us if there was one one point i would highlight and it's already been mentioned it's just, it's the communication and how we how we can communicate these values better and net gain is one one potentially really useful tool if it's done in a fair and equitable manner it could be quite a useful tool for communicating the value of different habitats and 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 and, and, and the like and, and certainly i think for us communicating the values of of of, of, of the, the restoration work that we need to do is certainly a, a key issue it's interesting you mentioned ecosystem services because that's that's uh, a conversation we've been having uh, over the last few years about natural capital ecosystem services and and it, it's kind of an unfortunate it's just how it went that heritage kind of fell out of uh, natural capital and the word natural kind of seems to exclude um, cultural but actually you know archaeological and heritage landscapes are an in intrinsic part of those sort of systems so actually uh, it, it's a relief for us um, that we're moving into a language of uh, the sustainable development goals rather than just the natural capital because it gives us yeah. it, it fits us a little bit better I think yeah I, th I think uh, yeah. The, the, you know the cultural is in if some ecosystem mm -hmm. service framework frameworks I mean one of my concerns is that well human well-being is not always in some of these the, frameworks i suppose our concern is there's, there's several different different types of frameworks and you can you can pick and choose the one you want to do and you and, and you could miss things if well-being isn't in it or or, or or you know maybe or culture or heritage isn't in it we're doing a study on on, on under interreg for um clinton devon estates at the minute looking at the restoration on the lower otter at exmouth ah, we're, and we're very well, very right? much trying to understand certainly the stakeholder view the pe people's view of, of, of what's going on but how we can take the existing models and perhaps develop something that's perhaps a bit more applicable a bit more useful for communicating the broader values not and, and doesn't miss out anything like that and, and captures everything we need to capture yeah i think that's that's one of the reasons it's so exciting that the the ea uh, uh, coming up with a holistic system of their own uh, i think which which should address a lot of our concerns hopefully we can spread that outside of the um of the framework as well All right i'd better move us on to the um next topic and as my commerce person just reminded me i forgot to ask this the poll question for this session which was do you already have the tools to demonstrate your sustainability contribution as part of the supply chain and that's one for the audience out there if you go on the right hand side so on to our uh, third theme of collaborative delivery. Um, there's another poll question on there as well, which is do you frequently work closely with subcontractors from different fields? So I'll kick straight off with the questions. Do the panel think there are opportunities for supply chain organisations like ours to collaborate further to work more sustainably? And has anybody got any good ideas on how that might be achieved? Um, yeah, again, yeah, if I could kick off. Yeah, I think um, we, we found there are certainly options to work together um, and often it it's not immediately obvious. So um, just as an example, recently we, um, some of our um, 
deep geophysics work turned out to be incredibly useful for uh, geotechnical investigations. Um, they used some of our data, um, which they only almost accidentally got hold of, realized it was really useful, and then used that to target um, their work as well as ours. And we're collaborating with the next phase of both archaeological and geotechnical works. That's interesting, so actually. That, sorry to interrupt, Mark. That, I know offshore isn't your um, field, but that happens quite a lot in uh, offshore wind work um, with geological teams there is the archaeologists tend to be interested in uh, essentially the, the squishy stuff at the top that the geologists aren't interested in and between us we can make a you know a really detailed useful model of the whole sequence which which is quite useful sorry to interrupt carry on no that's all right and i, I just wondered whether there were um, any other obvious ways we could do that because we, we occasionally work with uxo people we have similar types of surveys and um we can it, it's tricky but we can often um, um, use some of that data and I just wondered if there were any other options which we could explore not necessarily with archaeology but between supply chain. Well I know um, so I, I will not hog the mic um, I know that Hannah would be able to confirm that actually GI ground investigation work and archaeology can work very closely together the, the trick is as Nick was saying earlier is getting in at the design stage before the GI is scoped so often in archaeology we find ourselves coming back a, a, to a site uh, after a year and there may have been some GI done with very similar holes that we'd be making the year before so it's making sure that if you're going to dig a hole then use it for as many things as you can you just have to get around a table early on I think yeah, I totally agree. That's that's exactly what I'd say. From our, we we see it time and time again, and sometimes it's so frustrating. Um, but yeah, if if we could get around the table when the when the project's being scoped, I think, or or, or, or I, I don't know, I don't know realistically, logically how how it would be done. But like you say, the UXO, the archaeology, the GI aspects. There's such a massive overlap between them all um, that it's it does seem perhaps that we can't be smarter about trying to carry out that work and share each other's um holes exactly as you say mm. um and make and then have such a, a big um impact on or less of an impact on on the ground in the areas where we're working absolutely so, yeah yeah it's, it's it's we find it quite frustrating sometimes and we'd but, love to be able to do more but we're, we're so far down the chain i think that it's hard it's too late by the time we we're being part of the discussion often. I think that's that's one of the drivers for this is as all all sort of niche subcontractors if you like who do one thing and do it well are quite a long way down the chain often but the the way we see the, the you know the truly collaborative nature of the co collaborative delivery teams is that there should be the potential there to to get that input at an early stage from the teams and you know basically what are we all trying to do can we overlap some of it? Um, and yeah, I, I think it should be a, a relatively easy door to open, but I am very optimistic. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's the point of the collaborative delivery framework, isn't it? To try and have everybody round that table. Um, and I suppose a, a sort of a scientific answer to, to this question. I don't know how many around our virtual table today have been involved in the behavioural diagnostics research. Um, there's been uh, a big study, surveys, interviews, workshops, that sort of thing around um, the framework to look at collaborative behaviours and to see how it's working and to see how we could improve it and encourage it. Um, and in sustainable business, we're, we're going to be taking that work and see, well, how can we use that, use the learning about sustainability and, and bring those two things together. So that's um, some research that's been done in the EA. And, and three other qu quick things really is um, understand each other's contributions. And, you know, you can use things like the SDGs as an overarching framework for everything to actually see where those connections are. Um, be prepared to change a little what you do, perhaps. Um, if, you know, one thing's always done that way, it's always done that way, but slight tweaks can give big gain and I think the third point would be there's lots of um, things like this but lots of industry groups lots of networks that are, are specifically set up to try and encourage that sort of collaboration so it's as much about joining those as it is about identifying the gaps and where they don't exist and maybe creating them if they do just um, returning briefly to what Hannah and Mark were, were just saying um, you know interesting to from our point of view we um, do groundwater monitoring and um, 
and sort of wetland hydrology monitoring. And I think there's probably opportunities for collaboration with ground investigation work on the hydrogeology side as well in terms of um, potentially equipment and certainly um, sites. And I, I don't see an awful lot of that happening at the moment because, you know, projects are often so complex that the opportunities for these kinds of, of um, hookups and collaborations are, are just simply missed through the kind of programming and, and complexity of all the interrelationships. So, um, you know, one of the ideas I, I th thought about in sort of preparing for this was around um, a little bit, as Joe mentioned, around networks um, and, and sort of almost like knowledge sharing hubs, but perhaps even at a project or even a framework lot level so that um, different supply chain members just have a better understanding of who the other specialists are and mm -hmm. what their... Um, you know, I suppose what their sort of requirements are in terms of when they need to be on site and, um, you know, what their equipment requirements are. So it's a little bit easier to then be interacting with people that you're likely to be um, interacting with when you're working on an individual project. So there's a little bit of upfront work around collaboration on the, on the framework. I think that would be really helpful. Absolutely. It's, it's interesting, Joe, you said actually some of these um, groups may already exist uh, that we can have conversations in. It'll be uh, interesting to find out what is going on elsewhere. Sorry, Mark, were you just David. saying something? Uh, was it, no, no, it was wasn't it Chris? You, so my pictures are very small. I do for us. Chris, go for it. Sorry, David. I, I was just going to pick up on the last two speakers, both Joe and Tessa, and you, you've just highlighted it there. Um, so with the with plant, which seems to be um, the white elephant in the room, uh, picking your phrase, there are some really good, well-established groups in terms of the Supply Chain Sustainability School, for instance, mm -hmm. which has a plant group within it. Um, and that group's remit is... is broad and collaborative enough that all the plant providers, the OEMs, um, have actually brought in a lot of the technology providers because I think another panelist made the point, we have a lot of niche specialists who are doing some fantastic work, but they're, them getting their message out is a challenge. So they need to use, they need to piggyback off the, the big plant hires such as ourselves and, and the manufacturers. So if there are people in the audience who have questions in terms of what could we be doing, what could we be measuring and how can we demonstrate that value back to customers, that work exists. So don't, Think you need to go back and, and start from the beginning you know the the school amongst other groups is, is there to guide suppliers tier ones tier twos um and hires like us um from the get-go fantastic uh, can I, chris sorry can i just ask you you mentioned um about the importance of training your operators um yeah. I, I just think because in in our work we have archaeologists who are sort of directing plant um, and I'm sure the people do as well. Is there mileage in sort of training the people who are directing your operators in the best way to use plant? Um, Critically, yes. I, I think, Mark, you've highlighted something really, really important and has slipped through the gaps, um, even in my time in plant. So there are new skills coming on. And, you know, I, I'm using a, a general term, sort of a digital plant manager. That is a different job to a plant manager. That is somebody who has the ability to interpret the data that's put in front of them to make um, educated decisions on site. I still struggle today to, to emphasize the point greatly enough that if we don't change the ways of working, we're probably going to get the same results as we got yesterday. Um, so there is training available. Um, I think what we need to do as an industry is formalize that so that people are clear in terms of what their, what their staff could be put through. Yeah, that's a very promising avenue to explore. I think certainly I would like to think the days of the engine left idling all day just to keep the cabin warmer over, but I, I wouldn't bet on it. I, I've got plenty of data to uh, suggest they're not over yet. <laughs> Does anybody else have any, anything to say on collaboration before we move on into questions? We've still got a minute or two left. I'm just wondering how, how is the sort of the, the best way um, I'm just thinking about sort of um, again with plant. Um, do do you have um, are, are there sort of different types of um, ways of working for different types of um, subcontractors? If you're saying so, um, we have we often strip very large areas um, and have the plant running constantly. Do you have are there sort of different types of plant, different types of fuel that are best used for different types of work? Is I think is what I'm trying to say. Chris, does that make sense? 
Oh, I think Chris is frozen. That was a good All question right. as well. Uh, yes. Uh, so, yeah, okay. I know that there are, because I've talked to Chris before about this. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, you've you got a mixture was, of, yeah, mixture yeah, was, of electric and, and biodiesel and various yeah. other things. But yeah, we do use plant in, in weird ways, as I guess GI do as well, is sometimes, depending what sort of site it is, it's, it's very stop and start. Other times it's continuous use, different sizes of machines and that sort of stuff. But, yeah. yeah, it's definitely I, I, something we need to be on, yeah. isn't it? I must admit, I've never thought of asking the plant hire for the best um, plant for the type, describing the type of work. We just get so used to saying we need a 360 to strip this area full stop. Let's hire that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, we need to train our staff to be brave enough to ask the uh, the digger drive to turn his machine off while he's eating his crisps. Things like that, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> right. I shall, uh, on that bombshell, uh, move us on uh, to our questions section. So bear with me a second. We'll try and work out how to access it. Um, but this is also uh, an opportunity to carry on any discussions uh, if anyone's got any anything to carry on talking about that we've picked up so far. Uh, please feel free just to jump in and I will try and access the questions without cutting myself off. So here's, here's a good one from Terry Fuller. How can we most effectively utilize supply chains to drive more sustainable solutions, i.e. everyone at tier one early involvement? I guess that's something we've we've addressed um, to some extent already, uh, but does anybody have anything to add to that? Aha, Chris is just rejoining. I think from a client perspective, we, um just in terms of carbon we have scope three in our emissions but you know it's it covers more than carbon we we are very much aware that um impacts and value is all the way down the supply chain um and i think that was that's really important as far as the collaborative goes it it's that having everybody around there at the table when those early decisions are made when um when we're working out what project like what nick was saying you know not just about we're going to build but but how can we solve this solution how can, what solution can we come up with in this area and having everybody there all the way down and not just relying on messages to filter up yeah um i agree to so many suppliers who say actually had you asked us rather than asked our tier one to then ask us we would have been able to offer you a suggestion or a solution or a yeah. different approach. Yes, you do. Um, there are, you know, we, we've got all the niche areas of what we're trying yeah. to achieve and, and we all understand our own areas very well. And sometimes I think the advantages won't just be there's two holes being made over there. Can we just make one? It'll be actually we can do something completely different that we don't need yes. holes for with remote sensing or something like that. That actually in archaeology might be useful in habitat creation or in something else and yeah other things not to do with archaeology i guess matter to other people too <laughs> but yeah it's the exciting just, stuff i was just going to say i mean one of the things that you know we always sort of complain about or certainly it's a, a big issue in ecology um is that there is a very strong focus at the kind of on sustainability at the consenting stage and the design stage but um it, that obviously that um you know that that kind of team that delivers a project is not necessarily the team that is going to be managing the asset or, or whatever the project is further down the line and from an ecology point of view that is often around the management of habitats to retain the value but you know i, I wonder um i mean i know for example the environment agency is is very focused now on energy efficient pumps on flood defense schemes, you know, trying to make sure that the operational stage of the project is maximizing its um, sustainability outturn as well. But I just wonder whether there needs to be more of a focus on the operational and decommissioning stages of projects and, and how, you know, these, these projects that have a very long lifetime are performing throughout their, their whole life cycle. Yeah, I think that's in really well, doesn't it? Sorry, uh, go for it. I was just going to say that's, a, that's that's such an important point. I think about that whole life thinking and whole life approach, both in terms of cost and carbon. So, so from the early stages, again, I, I, I'm constantly talking about those early stages, but really not. It, there's often the tendency at those early stages to maybe just think about from a design perspective. 
materials and may, maybe starting to think about logistics and construction. But really, we need to be thinking about that whole life approach and thinking, OK, uh, how long will these materials last compared to these other materials? Or the, how long will this solution last compared to another? And how many interventions will there be, uh, maintenance interventions within that lifetime? And what's the carbon and sustainability Im and cost impact of that? And if we can have that whole life um, thinking approach from the very beginning, we, that's how I feel how we can sort of really optimize the solutions that we deliver um, and again it really does come back to that stakeholder engagement so working with all the key stakeholders across the supply chain to really understand what all of that looks like yeah I think it's massively important yeah. that's what is great hearing Joe say about how their the EA system is designed to to measure sustainability and outcomes and track outcomes through the lifetime of a project so some of the areas where we'd want to be contributing on um you know community sense of place and that sort of stuff they, those um those benefits continue and kind of develop over time and actually yeah, having them matter after the project's effectively finished if you like is yeah is crucial i think right let's have another question um this is this is a good one so the sustainability language we use is new for all our industries really how do you think we can communicate that effectively so it resonates with local communities uh, and demonstrates value so i guess what that really means is are sdgs going to mean anything to communities i mean having spent a couple of years wrestling with them they mean something to me now but i can see the point behind that question is how do we best um yeah communicate that value um to the, the people that we'll be impacting on anyone want to pick that one up I think to some extent, I mean, we, we don't need to use the SDGs to communicate with local communities. They, they are, there is a different way of sort of demonstrating our value to, say, for example, uh, the, the Environment Agency. Yeah. Um, when we talk to local communities, we can use a, a different language if that's appropriate. And as, as I mentioned before, um, translating sort of issues into archaeological narratives um, is a way we've looked at that in the past so we, we don't uh, say we don't need to mention sustainable development goals but identify what is useful as i'm sure maddie would agree what the audience is we tailor our language for that yeah it's like the the sdgs are are that framework or you know a, a language to um create commonality i suppose between different organizations um but they are they are also designed to be at a, a local level. Um, there's the uh, SDG Action app where you can see things that are really happening at, at local level involving individuals and community groups. Um, there's the G Good Life Goals, which translate the SDGs into actions that individuals can take within their families, within their households. And I think the other point is just increased familiarity. Um, I speak to so many local authorities who are saying this is how they need to think about place and people um, and local authorities and the local government association are also looking at this in terms of the way they express what they're delivering for their local communities so um, it's it's a tool that we can use and, and we don't have to use them when we speak to local communities but but there are ways should we wish to I think David, um, from our perspective, looking at the language we use, it's it's quite it's quite um, specific to our industry. You know the types of fuel, the types of engine power that we use, um, so in order to enable the communities to relate to what we're doing. I think it's about linking that to common factors. So what, what are they used to in their in their own world? Well, electric cars, I think that's that's coming up, becoming more mainstream, if topical, if, if not they're parked on their drives. So helping people understand what that is, but also the impacts that we're having, as, as Joe's just said, you know, what does it mean that we've got more efficient plant? Well, what that means is we have fewer fuel trucks on the road. And typically the types of plant and equipment we're talking about, you know, we're quite disruptive to communities when we're traveling through their villages, their towns. So if we can reduce the number of plant movements, um, have less plant on site because it's being more effective, then we can translate that, that to miles traveled through villages, through communities, the reduction of noise, the reduction of, reduction of fuel um, and emissions. So I think that is our way of, of talking to people we need to get away from our industry language because as you just said david it, it takes a couple of years to learn it ourselves and we're supposed to be experts at it yeah fantastic right well i'm afraid i better draw things towards a close because our hour's up believe it or not but 
as I said, we'd really like to carry on this conversation afterwards. Obviously, I've got all of your contact details. If anybody watching wants to be part of this conversation, uh, then yeah, please do just drop us a line. Oh, one last poll question, which I hope the answer to is yes. Do you think that the Flood and Coast community is a good forum to develop approaches to sustainability as a whole for wider industry? That's certainly what we're using it for. Having a, an ultimate client like the EA to drive this stuff is really valuable in exporting that stuff elsewhere. Um, right, let's wind things up. So thank you very much for coming, everybody. Thank you to our panelists and our, our audience. I think we've had good discussions and plenty of material to start developing. Where this goes from here, we shall see, but we'd really like to put together some sort of uh, guidance or white paper uh, with you all on on how best that um, subcontractors like ours can, can interact both with each other and with clients. Uh, please do get in touch. If you haven't already, please check out our Wessex Archaeology social media pages on LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter. It's another way to get in touch with us. And that's it. So enjoy the um, the rest of the conference. Not much of it left. And uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.